So first, let me tell a little bit my, about myself. I, I guess I've already been introduced, but my job as a solutions engineer at Databricks is to support customers that are learning Spark. Some of them are you know, just using existing Spark users that are learning to come up to speed with Spark on Databricks Cloud, and other ones are just totally new to Spark and helping them learn and get situated. So the goal of today's talk is, is mostly for beginning or early intermediate Spark developers. Um, even if you already use Spark, if there are some of the libraries that you haven't used before, this, this talk will be relevant. The thing is to help motivate people to start writing more apps in Spark. And I'll share some of the tips I've long, learned along the way to make that a little bit easier. I'm going to cover three applications today. So to start with, I'm going to go over a basic web logs analysis pipeline. Um, I think this is a great example. It's, it's a basic data pipeline. Our, our customers, the first thing they'll want to do when they start using Spark for the first time is start analyzing some files that are coming in. Um, this is really basic knowledge of an application that I've seen people develop time and time again. And it's a great way to come up to speed if you just want to start learning Spark and Spark SQL. The next application I'm going to demo is one on Wikipedia. So Wikipedia was kind of a very rich English data set that I thought was great for starting to apply machine learning. And the last bit is Facebook if you want to get into graph algorithms. So let's talk about the first application, web logs analysis. So I went with web logs because most organizations have web log data. So what I found when I first started working at startups is that they have all this data stored in text files and they don't have the infrastructure to actually analyze anything and gain all this important information that's coming from it. So, you know, if nothing else, the takeaway is that do something with that data, use Spark. And oftentimes this data set, it's too expensive to store in a database. So it's another good reason to go with Spark for it. And it's a super easy way to start using Spark. Um, the web logs that I'm going to go over today in this example is just standard Apache access logs. So even if you don't have logs yourself, if you go up online and look for Apache access logs, you'll be able to find some kind of sample set to get you started. And the scenario that we're talking about is web logs here where you have a different set of logs that are coming in on a daily basis. Okay, so let's go over a very simple Spark program here. So in order to read in my log files, I'm just going to call a text file command to read in uh, a web log. It's going to split that web log into lines. And on each line, it's going to call a simple function, parch Apache access log line. So that's just, it knows the regular expression that you can use to slurp in the different parts of the Apache access log. Um, and then I'm going to call a cache on that RDD in order to signal that that, that RDD should then be stored in memory. Um, but if you remember, Spark is actually lazy, so it's not going to do anything to actually populate the cache. So I'm going to call a simple count command on my, my access logs. So I, I have a feel for what the size is, but also it'll actually load up my cache. The next thing I'm going to do is just do something really simple to just calculate the content sizes of the different pages that are being returned by my web log server. So what I do with that is I take my RDD of access logs, I'm going to apply a simple map function to just grab the field that I care about, the content size, and cache that again since I'm going to be calling that several different times. Um, you know, it's kind of optional whether that cache is that efficient or not, but I chose to do it in this case. Um, to get the average content size, I can just do a reduce function where I add up the different content sizes and then divide by the total count. And to get the minimum or maximum size, you just call the simple actions min and max. Let's look at a, a little bit more complicated uh, Spark program here. This one is actually going to use key value pairs. So the first thing I'm going to do to access logs is I'm going to use a lambda function on it, and I'm going to output the IP address with an initial count of one as a pair. And then now, since I'm working with key value pairs, instead of calling reduce, I'm going to need to call reduce by key on my lambda function that adds two values together. And then I'm going to filter it in order to because I only care about IP addresses that have been accessed at least a minimum of n number of times. And then finally, you could just call collect right away now if you wanted to gather a set of those IP addresses. In my case, I'm going to want to register it as a Spark SQL table just because it's easier for me to analyze it that way. So I'm going to do a simple map function where my lambda takes in my key value pair, um, but it's going to create a row object with an IP address and count and mark those fields and then register as a temp table into Spark SQL. 
So you can see that obviously logs are just a great way to start learning the different transformations and actions in Spark. There's a lot of other statistics you can compute. One might be the response code count, so you can figure out what fraction of your web logs are returning the expected 200 response codes and maybe which ones are returning 500 response codes. It might point and indicate which of your endpoints are bad. Um, another one is you might just want to get a, a feel of the distribution of your different endpoints or what pages are being frequented on your site the most often. And there's obviously a lot more. Go crazy. Um, and th as I said, this is just a great way to learn about all the different Spark transformations and actions and how to chain them together. So now that I've said all that, I'm now going to say, contradict myself, and say that Spark SQL actually makes all of this stuff a lot easier. So let's go over the same two commands we did earlier, but let's just do it with Spark SQL. So to start off with, we're going to first have to figure out how to create a Spark SQL table. So that's really simple. All we have to do is use a create external table command. And the difference between, for those of you that are new to a Hive QL type of syntax, the external keyword is basically telling Spark that the directory where you have the log files, it should have read access to that directory. So if you were to drop this table, do not delete those files. You, so call a create table command, um, give it the schema inside of it, so IP address is a string, content size is an int, um, and so on, and then call your SERTI. In this case, I'm calling a regex SERTI, and then I'm gonna pass in my regex that actually knows how to parse each Apache access log line. And finally, the location where those log files are stored. And that's enough, so now you have a Spark SQL table that you can query. So in order to just do the content size stats that we did on the first page, you can actually just do a select some content size divided by count star, or you can even just call the average function on the content sizes, call min and call max, and just do a select from access logs, and you have all those content size stats that we computed earlier. Let's look at the frequent IP addresses. So remember before we had to use key value pairs, reduce by key, and all those functions. Now we just do a simple select with a group by and a having. So select IP addresses, count star as total, from access logs, group by IP address, having total greater than N. So I'm sure a lot of you are really familiar with SQL. Um, this is probably a lot easier to do than the example that we did before. Okay, now let's talk a little bit more. Th that gets you calculating your actual statistics, but we actually have a data pipeline that's flowing in. We have logs that are coming in every single day and getting refreshed. So a tip that I have there is to actually use uh, Spark SQL partitioning in order to register different directories if your logs are coming in on an hourly or daily basis. So this allows you to only analyze the files from days that you care about, which means you can just skip straight to those folders. You don't have to read the whole data set all the time. And that's why partitioning is so powerful. So you'll want to do, in order to do this, you'll have to do a alter table, add partition with the location of your logs command in order to register your different partitions. So now whenever you do a, a SQL query, but you say where date equals 2015-03-18, it's going to know only to look at the log files contained in that folder, logs 2015-3-18. Um, another little subtlety to notice is oftentimes when you're bringing in log files, there's going to be a few of your logs that end up in the wrong log file, um, perhaps because it comes from at, towards the end of the day. Um, so one thing to say is, you know, if you have a lot of data and you're trying to notice a general pattern, maybe those few little records that slip in towards the end of the day, they don't matter. So you might be okay just having a little bit of inaccuracy um, and skipping those lines. Or if you do care, then you might want to actually look at the, spy the partition before and spy the partition after, and then make sure in your where clause you actually check the timestamp and make sure it falls on the day that you care about. So either of those methods should work pretty well, depending on how much accuracy you need. The next thing that our customer is doing is they might occasionally want to bring in a job, a really large batch job that runs on all of their data for all of time, but most of the time they're only cared about statistics for the last end days, be it the last seven days or the last month. And so for that, you'll want to actually cache those files for the last end days and, so that you can analyze those really simply and really quickly. Um, right now, the way that Spark SQL is currently, you can't actually cache, when you cache a table, you have to choose to cache the entire table or not. So you can't just cache certain partitions. So a really simple workaround 
if you want to just cache the last end days, is just to create a copy of your table with another create external table command, another logical table with the exact same kind of schema that you specified in last place, but only register partitions for the last end days on that particular table. And that means that you're gonna, in your nightly batch job, you're gonna have to have something that uncaches the old version of the table. It's gonna update the table definitions, so it's gonna unregister, it's gonna drop the partition from the day that rolls off, and then it's gonna add the partition for the most current day. And then now you can recache your table, and, and so you'll have the last seven days. So we recommend, a lot of my customers do this in a batch job that runs overnight, so that their cache is up and running and ready for them to start querying in the morning. Um, and the last a bit to, to use is to use Spark SQL to monitor your pipeline. So what you might find is you're running a batch job every night now, running some stats on your logs, and you might find that over time, as ho hopefully your, your, the traffic coming to your website is growing and growing and growing in size, so slowly your batch jobs are gonna start to creep up and take more and more time to start running. And that's a case, you probably just wanna use a larger Spark cluster to analyze your logs, but I, I'd like to know and keep track of exactly how long my batch jobs are taking so that I know it, when it's getting to that point. So in order to do that, you can just use Spark SQL, a table there, and write a new role to give some statistics about your batch job. Um, the way that Spark SQL works, though, is you can't, it's not the same as just standard MySQL, where if you want to insert a row into there, you just do a values command. Instead, you can only insert from another table. So I, what I do is I just programmatically create a tiny little temp table, and it just has one little row with some statistics about my run, maybe what time it started and how long it took to run. And then you can just do an insert into table, um, your pipeline table, from your temporary table. Uh, another thing to note here is if you run this every single night on your batch job, what's actually gonna happen is that Spark SQL is gonna create a whole new file for your run little row over time. So what, then what you're gonna find is when you start querying this and you have you know, 60 days worth of data, even though you only have 60 lines, Spark is trying to read it in 60 files, which is kind of slow. So to do that, you can just use, you can use Spark, use a coalesce command, which is you know, similar to the repartition command, but it's meant for when you're, you have a whole bunch of partitions and you want to bring down the number of partitions. Use that to resave and recode your table and then replace it. So that'll make it so that you have a new Spark SQL table that will monitor your pipeline so that you can track it. Okay, and with that, I'm gonna show you a little bit of a demo now. I'm gonna start with a Python example. So most of this code we've already gone over. This is where I have, this is where I have my data files and my log. This is the actual function that I, I registered which knows how to parse my Apache log access line to pick out all the fields that I care about. I'm gonna load in my access logs RDD, calculate the content size stats, do the frequent IP addresses. This is actually where I do the response codes that we mentioned before as another one. So that was actually easier than the frequent size stats because I just had to do a map and a reduce by key. Um, I've chosen to display it here as a pie chart. And then this is the other one where I'm looking at the distribution of endpoints and just kind of showing a graph to see it doesn't look like there's any major outliers here, although there's some variance. Great, and let's look at the same example in SQL. So this is the create external command that we went through. The content size stats, the frequent IP addresses, the same response code, so it just fits in one line really easily. And, and this time in the endpoints, it was really easy for me to do an order by so then I could see exactly what my curve of traffic across the endpoints looks like. Great, now I'm gonna go over the next application. So my next application is Wikipedia. The first thing I had to do if I want is to actually download Wikipedia. So you can actually download the text for Wikipedia in one giant file, it's, it's, it's pretty big. I think it's 250, 100 something megabytes or gigabytes. Um, it would take several hours to download. So I, I'm kind of impatient. If you're impatient like me and you happen to have a cluster of machines at your disposal, um, you, there's actually also the option to download Wikipedia in 27 parts. And so I figured I'd just spin up a Spark cluster uh, 
and use, use my Spark cluster to download Wikipedia faster. So to do that, all I did was I took the list of the articles that I needed to retrieve, and I used sc.parallelize in order to create an RDD out of it. So once you do that, you could just do a dot map command and then download it from Wikipedia. That's what I started with, but what I actually found is that Wikipedia will block connections if you're trying to download more than three files at any, from one IP address at a time. So I, instead I had to use this little bit of a trick here where I control the number of partitions that I had so that I could size my RDD according to the number of machines that I had so that I could make sure that no one machine was gonna download more than three articles at a time. And then I used a map partitions function to download my articles one by one. And then I could even write logic to pause more in between if Wikipedia seemed to be rate li limiting me, um, whatever it was. So I did find I had to spend a lot of time in this code to make this very robust in terms of doing this download. Uh, the next, next thing I to, to, had to do was then parse the XML data that I got back from Wikipedia. So I ran into a couple problems there. One of which is that most of the files that I was downloading were a few hundred, uh, a few hundred megabytes, which is fine. But when your file size creeps up to where it's a lot larger than one gigabyte, Spark tries to break up the same file to be processed in multiple, by multiple partitions. And it, it starts to be around one gigabyte, is at least the way it was worked on my, my one cluster that I had, the way it was configured. The problem with XML data is it's not easily splittable. So it doesn't break like your usual text files at the end of line character. Instead, you're looking for specific begin and end tags, and they may not even just split evenly with line end breaks. So my solution was that after I downloaded the file, I immediately uncompressed it, and then I broke it down into lines. So the, the best way to store your XML file is if you can have one XML element, what you consider to be a logical group, in, in my case it was one article of Wikipedia, and write it all in one line. And so that way I could use the xc.txt file command again. Just some caveats with um, processing XML data. Okay, and then the next thing I did was I used Spark to ETL my data. So I, I didn't care about all the fields from the Wikipedia articles. There were only certain fields that I found interesting that I wanted to actually analyze. So I used, I used Spark for that to pull out only the fields I cared about. And then the next thing is I wanted it to query fairly fast. And so I chose Parquet file format for that. Since it, it's a great file format, it's, it's compressed easily compressible and, and fast to decompress. And I use that to register a Spark SQL table since there's already a clearly defined schema. The next bit was I started to use Spark for fast data exploration once I had the Wikipedia data set. So if, if you're used to the Hadoop world, once you get your data set in and you're actually trying to analyze things, it's really slow. With Spark, it made it a lot faster to the point where I didn't have to wait hours for my job to complete. Um, I, I cached the data, obviously, for faster querying. Uh, really enjoyed the interactive programming experience. And the other thing I did was I really made use of a mix of Python and Scala combined with SQL in order to analyze my data set. And the last thing I did with Wikipedia was I used it to start playing around with MLlib. Um, obviously, Wikipedia is an awesome, an awesome set of data for the English language. I chose the word to vec algorithm because it's a simple algorithm that can learn synonyms and you can apply it easily to each Wikipedia article. And I urge you guys after this to try out other ML and NLP algorithms, that, whichever ones are your favorite. Okay, let's do a demo. Okay, I'm just gonna choose Python for these. So this is where I, I scraped Wikipedia. I first went and programmatically retrieved the, from the dumps.wikipedia.org site a list of all the articles and, and used, programmatically grepped out a list of all the links that I wanted to download. And here they are, you can see the sizes of the different articles. Some are 45 megabytes and then there's this really large one right here that is 2.7 and 2.8. Um, I did a lot of things just to make this really robust to make sure if I downloaded a file, I wouldn't download it again, even if I ran my smart command multiple times. This is where I check to make sure that I'm not getting rate limited from Wikipedia. I found that it returned a, a different content type if it's after you have more than three requests that are outstanding. 
This is the part where I'm actually uncompressing the file and splitting it into multiple parts that are around less than one gigabyte in size. And then this is where I actually create my RDD from my articles to retrieve and do the map partitions and download all the parts of Wikipedia. So I kept doing this until it all ran. Okay, next let's look at the ETL part. So this is where I took each XML element and actually pulled out all the different fields that I cared about. The title, the redirect title, a timestamp, the last contributor username, and the text of the article. I used that to create a schema RDD, and then I saved it as a Parquet file and loaded it into Spark SQL and cached the table. So this is just me sanity checking by doing a count from the Wikipedia set and grabbing the title. Perfect. Now the next thing I'm gonna do is kind of explore and get a feel for my data set. So this is where I use that pattern that I mentioned where I define a function in Python, contains Word, but then I actually call it from SQL. So here I'm selecting a title, the title of all articles from Wikipedia that contains the word animal. And here's a list of some of those articles. I'm also doing a word count just to get a feel for the distribution of words in Wikipedia. And you can see that it's, it's a very, very long tail. This time what I'm doing is I'm going to, what I'd like to do is figure out how many articles mention different countries on the Wikipedia set. So here I'm actually going and getting, grabbing a list of country names and then mapping to them to their ISO 3166 code. And this is my code for actually going through the text to figure out what countries are included on, in that particular article. And here's where I'd get the country counts by selecting the text from Wikipedia and putting it to my other function. So of course, when I look at this, again, we see kind of a long tail that certain countries are mentioned a lot more than others. And then I actually displayed it in a graph here. So you can see that the US and India are mentioned really often in English Wikipedia and then African countries and South American companies are less. Great, so now I get a feel for my data set. Now I'm actually gonna do MLlib against it. Oh. Oops. Great, so here I'm selecting the text from my Wikipedia set. If I wanna actually put it into MLlib, what I have to do is, the, the algorithm that I'm gonna run is called word to vec to, in order to use synonyms, and what it's expecting is it's expecting an array with words where all the words are in order of the sentence. So I'm gonna do a real crude cleaning of the text in each of my Wikipedia articles. So one, I'm gonna, one, I'm only gonna care about the text field of the Wikipedia article. I'm gonna filter out any articles that are empty. I'm gonna lowercase it. Some of the articles are just redirects. I don't care about those. I'm gonna filter them out. I'm gonna split each article into sentences so, so that I can, you know, because since it's trained on sentences, not articles. And then I'm gonna just try to scrape and clean out any punctuation, re repetitive spaces, anything like that. So at the end, what I should get is, is a clean set of arrays that represent the words in a sentence. And this is where I just took a sample of five of them to look at them. And you can see that they look okay. They're fairly clean, these are all lowercase words, doesn't seem to be any junk in it, so I decided it was good enough for me to actually start training my model. So this is, so we can see here, there's actually 403 million sentences that I used to train this synonyms model. And then this code I just copied and pasted from the MLlib page, and this just calls word to vec. I'm, I am doing some, some pruning, so you know, the, the English data set is around 170 or, 170,000 or so common words in the, in the dictionary. However, that doesn't include proper nouns. And since it's Wikipedia, there's obviously lots and lots of proper nouns. So I, I wanted to prune the data set a little bit by making sure a word appeared at least a thousand times before I even included it in my, in my vocabulary. And then I, I fit a synonym model on it and then now I can find synonyms. So first I just started with a simple word like soccer. You can see it found some other sports like lacrosse and basketball and football but even words associated with soccer like leagues. Next I tried some proper nouns like China. So that has some other countries, some, some cities even within Asia. 
you know, the, the name John is returning a bunch of other men's names. And then this is kind of the fun one, which is I tried to find synonyms for Apple. And when you look at this list, it's very clear that Wikipedia's definition of Apple is definitely the company Apple rather than the fruit by looking at this list of synonyms. Great, okay, so now we're gonna go with the next app, which is just Facebook. So I, it was also really nice to use Spark since I, what I did was I grabbed my list of friends and then I grabbed the list of friends of my friends. And so that quickly, if you actually have a lot of tokens and other things, the number of calls that you need to make are, are increasing by a lot. So that was great to use Spark to speed that up and make a lot of those calls in parallel. Um, I have one thing to note about my app, which is it only shows friends it only shows my friends and my friends that have also enabled the app. So if you build a Facebook app, I was only able to get one person to OK my app, which was me, and get that one access token. If you build a real app and you get a lot more people to give you access to their Facebook data, you'll be able to have a much more complete view of the graph than I did in, in my little app. So I used, the, the next thing I did was I used GraphX to learn on the data. So I used the page rank algorithm to determine who's the most popular. And I put stars by that, because then again, in this case, it was my friends and my friends of friends. So clearly, I'm going to win this contest pretty easily. Um, and to call GraphX, I just had to do two things. One, one is I had to output user data, um, which is the, where I took the Facebook user ID and mapped it to a person's name. And the second thing I had to do was output edges, where I used user ID to user IDs, which uh, models the friend relationship. And I'll do a little demo. So this is where I scraped my Facebook friends. I came up with a little function that you can actually read from the Facebook URL and return the JSON of that response. I couldn't use Spark to do this first part because the way pagination works in Facebook, you have to retrieve your request before you get a link for the next page. So I just did this in a simple loop. But if you had multiple access tokens, this would have been a great case where each access token you could make as one element of the RDD, and then you could use that to scrape the initial set of friends for all your access tokens in parallel. Now that I have my list of all my friends though, this is when I was actually able to create an RDD using the sc.paralyze command on the IDs and then use the map command to make a bunch of calls to Facebook API in parallel. And finally, I take all my JSON responses and I dump it as a text file. And this is an example of what the file looks like. And then I call SQL context JSON file, since I have JSON files, and I can then register it as a temp table. So then I can count star, and I can do a select, sta select statement against that temporary table. And this is where I called GraphX. So first I just grabbed all of my friends by hard coding my ID. And then I used this to create all the different user ID to names. Um, in an RDD and wrote that out to a text file. Then I use this one where I get the friends of each particular row and I create all the friend to friend relationships here and save that out as a text file. And then I just copy and paste this code from the GraphX site to actually call GraphX to do the page rank. The only thing I did was instead of just collecting the values, I created case classes out of them so I could register that as a temporary Spark SQL table. And Let's do this, the select statement. So as predicted, I, I won the page rank algorithm amongst my friends. And you know, th this actually works with the next two on the list. These two friends um, are my friends that also work at Facebook. So it's no surprise that they're the people who had the most mutual friends of mine that also enabled the Graph Explorer app on Facebook. Great, so, so that's all I have today. Um, I hope this talk has inspired you to write some Spark applications on your favorite data set and play with every one of the libraries. They're pretty easy to get started with. And as you get more advanced, you can do trickier things with them as well. Uh, my personal opinion is hacking and making mistakes, it's the best way to learn. If you do want more structure though about learning examples, the, on Databricks we have some sample reference apps that you can follow along with. Just go to our GitHub, it's under github.com Databricks reference apps. Thank you.